Welcome everyone to uh, the Science Circle panel discussion program. Uh, this is a new format uh, that the Science Circle is trying um, in addition to lectures. Um, and uh, we have, uh, so we're trying a format of panel discussions in voice. So uh, everyone make sure you can, you know, hear us in voice um, and uh, um, we have uh, three panelists up front here beside me um, Vic, uh, Syzygy and SR um, so let's all give them a round of applause <laughs> um, and uh, Today's topic is going to be the Fermi Paradox, uh, which essentially asks the question uh, in a, uh, I think maybe we'll limit this just to a galaxy, but in a galaxy, you just full of potentially habitable planets and vast, vast amounts of time. Um, you know, why aren't we seeing any aliens? Where are the aliens? So um, that's kind of the basic premise. Um, I would like to um, begin the program by asking each um, panelist to give a brief kind of opening remarks um, about what they want to say. And um, then we'll kind of open it up to a little more freewheeling format and if the audience members have any questions or comments I will try to be monitoring the nearby chat and select questions for the panel to discuss. All right so um, Vic if you're ready why don't you <clears throat> uh, start with uh, your uh, opening remarks. <clears throat> sure okay. Um, let's see. Also, I can back uh, some of this up with some pre-formatted uh, text. Uh, one of the things to consider is that there are several uh, factors. Some are environmental factors that are known, like evidence-supported. Some where are not known. In other words, we just don't have enough evidence. Some are an human factors, anthropomorphic. Uh, some are known. For example, we have evidence or, or it's in the past. And then some we just have to guess at. So when we're looking at all these uh, factors, think of uh, those categories. Uh, briefly, uh, and then real quick, briefly, the argument was first made by Enrico Fermi back in 1950, and then by a guy named Michael Hart. And then uh, Frank Drake in 1961 uh, published his famous uh, multiplicative uh, factors equation. I met him in the late 60s when I was doing some uh, uh, work at NASA. Uh, so this has been a um, favorite topic of mine for about 50 years. I'm done. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Vic. Um, uh, a very excellent way to set the table for us. And uh, Syzygy, do you have any opening remarks? Uh, yes, I do. Thanks, uh, Berna. Hi, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. The Fermi Paradox, you could um, frame it in a, a simple nutshell with a couple of questions. Are we alone in the universe? And if not, then where the hell is everybody? Now, the Fermi Paradox <laughs> is is fascinating because it unites so many fields, physics, biology, geology, the very nature of intelligence. Um, <clears throat> yes, that's right, Vic. It's 1933. I might have mistyped that. Uh, the Drake equation has been mentioned, and this is related to the Drake equation. Um, just a minute. Let me close the window here. The Drake equation has many factors to it, and one of the factors is the number of planets that each star has. And we have observations now of exoplanets, so we are actually able to make uh, reasonable estimates of how many planets you expect for each star. So bit by bit, the Drake equation will, it will become less guesswork. We can have a reasonable estimate of the number of intelligent civilizations that are out there capable of communicating with us, which is what the Drake equation gives us. Then we have a, a way of addressing the Fermi paradox. 
and a better uh, and will better understand the Fermi paradox. And directly or indirectly, it may uh, drive us forward in one way or another. One solution to the Fermi paradox is that advanced uh, civilizations self-destruct. Is that what's going to happen to us? I mean, we really uh, want to understand what happens to other civilizations if they're out there. Or maybe the solution is that we're alone in the universe and we've always been alone. In that case, we are precious because we are an oasis in the barren universe, which means that we should that we, we must treasure the earth and all the life on it, all the people on it. All our, uh, we must elevate ourselves above our petty squabbles and conflicts. And this is what the, F, the thinking of the Fermi paradox can do for us. Uh, okay. Excellent. That was outstanding. Thank you very much. And uh, our final panelist is uh, SR, who uh, is a, um, I think, uh, many of us will recognize from Science Circle. Um, so, uh, SR, uh, do you have any uh, opening remarks you'd like to make? Um, thank you very much. And it's the first time that I am joining here. And I'm thankful to all of you. Um, I would like to say Vic has made some great remarks about all those things. And I think there are some mythological um, ideas or something that are written in Hindu mythology too, which depicts that it is possible that there are many worlds similar like us. That is the only thing that I would like to add. All right. Thank you very much. That's good. Um, I, uh, what I'd like to do uh, with this next round of the discussion, actually, uh, also maybe a little bit uh, more structured than I anticipated, but let's go down the panel again and let's discuss maybe um, your favorite or some interesting uh, theories uh, that are maybe um, kind of the leading contenders for an explanation of, um, you know, why we haven't found aliens. So, Vic, why don't you start, if, the, if this seems like a good way to approach it? Sure. Uh, one of the things is just a couple of days ago at a conference in uh, Houston, uh, one of the SETI pioneers, I'm going to put the text up here in a reference, um, basically said that if you were to look at all the places we could be looking for intelligent extraterrestrials, that, and, it, and that area was the size of the ocean, that we have only looked at a hot tub worth. And by looking on, say, Mars or the uh, moons of Saturn or Jupiter, it's kind of like lo looking at a spoonful uh, to see if there is life out there. So hopefully we may be able to find some micro microbes in that spoonful, but just because we haven't found a dolphin in a hot tub doesn't mean that uh, there <laughs> isn't intelligent life out there. Uh, yeah, I think that is interesting. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I make of that because it kind of makes me feel about like uh, just sort of statistical polling that normally you can, you know, just getting a small sample of a population can tell you a lot about the overall or or larger scale um, as characteristics of that population. So I'm not completely convinced that the small sample size is completely dispositive, but certainly it's important. And uh, Syzygy, would you like to make any remark, sort of what your favorite explanation is of the Fermi paradox? Or anything you find interesting about uh, sort of some of the uh, uh, suggestions that have been put out there? Um, I, I am somewhat, uh, I somewhat agree with Vic. I think that there is um, uh, life elsewhere in the universe, whether it's intelligent or, uh, or not, is, is another question. Um, and I should post that link. Um, I recommended this video to um, to, to Chantal and Berrigan about the um, Isaac Arthur videos. Um, they're, they're excellent videos. They're very dense in information. And uh, he lists something like 50 hurdles for intelligent life to uh, has to clear. 50 hurdles. Um, from the conditions uh, in the solar system, the conditions in the, in the, on the planets. And sorry, Baron, you, you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say it does make it seem as if the fact that we're alive, that Earth has life at all, just, just unbelievably improbable. 
On the other hand, it strikes me that the Earth and our solar system are utterly ordinary, the galaxy. I mean, that's sort of our defining quality is that we're completely ordinary. So that suggests that maybe it's not all that improbable after all. I don't know what to make of it. Yes, but the, that's the that's the mediocrity principle that somehow uh, when you have a sample <laughs> of something, you think that everything else is, is the same as that one sample. And if you consider 50 hurdles, um, there there were interesting hurdles. If you he said that let's just adopt say a 50% chance that that you can clear each each of these hurdles. So that's one half to the 50th. So that's like one in 10 to the 15, which is a yeah, very yeah. tiny probability. Um, the problem I have with that argument is that it's possible that those 50 hurdles, there may be some kind of connection between the different probabilities. There they may, they may be some kind of condition that's that one probability affects the other. Uh, well, I also so I, think that the system isn't completely random because we have chemistry. And chemistry sort of, you know, um, makes some, you know, reactions more likely than others. It's not completely random like just rolling dice or something. There are kind of forces at work in nature that sort of, you know, sort of make things more likely than they're unlikely. Yes, that's a good point. That's that's what, what Nero went, a Wonder was just saying, and that's what I've been saying, that the, the different yeah, probabilities yeah. might not be independent of one another. So it might not be quite that bad. But another thing that was brought up in this video, which is a very good point, is if you take the to total mass of the solar system, then you take the total mass of humanity, assuming that we're the only intelligent life form on the planet, which is maybe not necessarily the case, but let's consider that. Then uh, that total mass, the, the fraction of the total mass of the solar system, which is basically the mass of the sun, which is not, is, is like 1 times 10 to the minus 19, which is 0 .00 with 18 zeros 1. That's a very tiny fraction. So a tiny fraction of our solar system that is actually intelligent. OK, so that's kind of sobering. Um, <laughs> um, SR, would you like to comment on uh, maybe what your uh, thoughts are about uh, um, why we aren't seeing more aliens? Well, I'd like to uh, tell you one interesting thing that has happened in my life. Uh, it's a, uh, one day I was in uh, my roof and I was using my torchlight and I was flashing it towards the sky and I saw some uh, you can say a reply back in the same flashing way and it was continuous for about 15 minutes so I don't know whether I should say there are aliens or not but as per our Hindu mythology is concerned we say that there are parallel universes and in each and every universe, there are intelligent people who are living. I would like to uh, give the link about how the Hindu mythology describes about the whole universe. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I think uh, Hindu mythology has a lot to say about um, this, yeah, actually. Well, the, the concept of mandalas, for example, and the, the, the so forth. Um, from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are just really seem to be um, uh, imbued with kind of a sense, a kind of a celestial sense. Uh, well, uh, I would like to say one more important point along with that. Um, in the Shiv Purana, it is said that the whole universe. Uh, was dark and there was only one light it's it was called Jyoti Lingam and from there the whole universe has started it seems to be like the Big Bang Theory so it's my question that uh, if there was some Big Bang Theory someone has written that thing so I think there are some parallel universe or something like that where people have seen all these things that has happened and they have written in these things in this box that we are nowadays we are trying to uh, you can say search it out and find out what are the things inside which are very interesting for us well thank you very much sr i think that's a really uh, valuable um, uh, perspective on this question uh i noticed in the and also uh Sidji, thank you for the isaac asimov
Isaac Arthur video link in nearby chat and also to Vic for his calculation uh, that he uh, posted in nearby chat. Um, and uh, Irlanda uh, asks about how about the age of those planets compared to the Earth? And I think that's maybe worth touching on for a little while. That is, the age of the universe uh, opens up the possibility that um, intelligent life has flourished in the past, um, but, uh, you know, but we missed them. Um, and uh, so let's maybe talk a little bit about the, uh, the age, uh, the age of the universe or the age of the galaxy and what kind of uh, opportunities that might have presented for life. Well, that's a, that's a good question. The age of the universe is 13.8 um, uh, billion years. Um, uh, the thing is, the, the age of our galaxy, um, it, it depends because there are basically two populations of stars, what are called the population two stars, which are, um, which are the older stars, and the population one stars, like our sun, which are about 5 billion years old, or at least our sun is 5 billion years old. So the exoplanets, most of them that, that have been found are, are more or less... Uh, uh, close to our sun, um, I don't remember the exact distances, but they are um, in the, in the galactic neighborhood, and they would and they would be around stars that are of somewhat similar age to our sun. So it's probably safe to guess that these exoplanets are more or less the same age as the age of our our, our Earth. Uh, that's kind of the impression I have too. I mean, if anything, maybe younger. Um, so that's interesting. Um, uh, the um, uh, so uh, well, I'll just move on. Um, Syzygy or SR, do you have any uh, anything thinking about the age of uh, the universe? Uh, prompt uh, any any thoughts in your mind about it? Yeah, uh, I I would like to add one note on this. Um, I'm giving you a link that everyone can see. Uh, in this link, if you go throughout it, it is said that in, as per the Hindu mythology is concerned, we have four yugas. These four yugas represents the age or the time period of a certain era. And as per the calculation of our Hindu mythology, the current age of the universe is about 155 point something trillion years. So it's an interesting thing might be for you people that uh, every era has some uh, years which represents the development of a certain civilization and its destruction. So that's the point from my side. All right. Uh, thank if you I... very much. Yes, go ahead, Vic. Yeah, I'd like to weigh in for a second. Is um as I put in text is that we could probably like you said is figure out all the physical factors pretty soon I mean some are guesses like the video says okay if only 0.1 percent of the habitable planets had life blah blah there'd be a million stars and then I put a uh, mathematical equation that basically said okay great so we there should be somebody within 1500 light years but really it comes down to the factors we really don't know uh, for example how uh, long a civilization is out there, how they communicate, uh, whether they even care to or have the resources to uh, go to other planets, how long that takes, uh, all that good stuff like that. Because, I mean, physically, if, if everybody, if the whole argument were a linear progression where you have life, it becomes intelligent, they communicate in radio waves or like we're doing here, they travel to the stars and that kind of stuff, then we should be seeing people. But the alarming part is, why not? In other words, what yeah, happens? Yeah. Do they yeah, kill yeah. themselves off? Do they kill each other off? Do they just decide, no, they're going to use the resources better than to go running around the universe? I mean, uh, that that's a really big question. Well, right. And I don't think that humans have discovered any special secret sauce about the universe that, um, you know, we're doing something weird that another civilization wouldn't do. I mean, radio waves exist. I mean, they were easy for us to discover. They're just out, they're just there. 
And anybody can find them. And if you find them, then you're going to start experimenting with them. And I think the same can be said for sort of a lot of uh, essential technologies like that. They're not hidden. They're just right there for us to discover. And I think other life forms would discover them too. So the, I think... The, the idea that somehow the aliens would be communicating by some exotic technology um, or that they have discovered some secret sauce either means they're super advanced, that they have a deeper understanding of reality than we're not even close to that. Or if they're kind of like us, then they're probably going to use the same stuff we, we do. I mean, our we can only search for life that we can recognize, basically. Yeah. Uh, the other argument, though, is that we don't have any, like, radio wave fossils. We can go back on our own Earth or other planets and look for stuff that was billions of years old, but they could have been chatting up a storm a few hundred years ago and we'd never know it. We've only yep. Yep. known about radio waves for a hundred years, and even less time we've been listening. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of like yeah. a blink of an eye, and then if we don't see anything, we assume they're not there. So I kind of um, – I'm reminded of the uh, discovery of the signal in the movie Contact and sort of my – sort of the – what it reminds me of, or I was actually watching it with friends who were talking about this, is that Carl Sagan's story in Contact really kind of lays out the classic sort of um, conventional wisdom of, you know, how we would discover alien life. Um and uh, my friend said, well, you know, but, uh, you know, I can barely get my Wi-Fi connected or if my Wi-Fi breaks, I can't even fix it. Or so uh, what are the, you know, what are the odds that this elaborate um, sort of multidimensional communication we get from the aliens in contact? Because you remember how they discover all of these deeper layers of information when they look at it in three dimensions that and look at different so forth. Yeah. So each time they discover another level of information, there's all this com sort of a very complex transmission of information, and it works perfectly. They discover all of it, you know. So, uh, so it kind of made me wonder, sort of, you know, I mean, that's really what we probably would have to do to look for life, something that we would recognize as obvious to us. But, um, uh, you know, is that the most likely form? Is or are there? Would there? Is it just as likely there are exotic life forms out there that we couldn't? Well, I have a couple of comments. One is about the, 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 the uncertainty of the various factors in the uh, Drake equation mentioned by Vic. Uh, one of the uh, most uncertain is, is what's called abiogenesis. How did life actually form from inert matter? Um, and that's, no one really understands that. No one really knows what the probability of that is. And uh, as far as radio waves are concerned, there's a, an interesting way of looking at it is that our uh, planet has been producing radio waves or, or television signals as well. So we have um, episodes of Howdy Doody um, from the 1950s uh, uh, that have reached like 60 light years away from Earth. The question is, could they be able to de would they be able to detect those radio waves? Would they be able to detect us? And that, that is a very big question. Because if they had a radio telescope, something like uh, Arecibo, which is an entire valley, 300 meters, or the Chinese one, which is 500 meters, would a telescope like that be able to detect signals coming from the Earth, and how far away would they be able to detect it before the signal was lost in the north of the galaxy? And that's only like a fraction of a light year. So if you have a civilization, if there are other civilizations like ours, not really advanced civilizations, you would probably not be able to detect them unless they beamed their, their signal directly at us. Right, or had they had some incredibly high-powered signal that could somehow make it to us, which, yeah. That's tough. Yeah, and Vic's right. They're, they're, we do know a little bit about how life uh, life forms, um, but but actually how it forms in, in, a, in a wild environment uh, from, from inert matter, uh, it's, 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 the details are still uncertain. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm actually a little bit confused about, in some ways it seems like life just took forever to emerge and kind of become anything more complicated than a cell, really. I mean, that took like a billion, like for a billion years, sort of nothing happened. <laughs> nothing really changed. And then sort of there was, and then there was a really kind of a gradual emergence of more complex forms until we had sort of a sudden explosion of life, which I think is attributable to an increase in oxygen from 
photosynthesis. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, Vic makes a good point. First of all, a cell is, is, is a very complicated uh, structure. It is. I, I don't mean to diminish that. That's right. The first ones, apparently, there are fossil cells 3.8 billion years old, and the Cambrian explosion was like 500 million years ago. So it was like 3 billion years that uh, that uh, that there was no really complex life. Yeah. It was blue-green blue algae producing lots of oxygen. And when you have enough oxygen, then you can get much more complicated life because you have a good energy source. Yeah, basically getting to the cellular stage is uh, fantastic. And we were able to do that, or we, haha, uh, whatever. Life on Earth was able to do that within the first billion years once everything cooled and we got past some of the bigger hurdles. Uh, jumping to multicellular thing is was really not as difficult as the getting to the cell part. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. The cell part um, is just um, sort of jaw dropping that it happened. But on the other hand, the 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 organization of the cell does. Oh, uh, Sr, can you uh, turn your microphone off or turn it down? Thank you very much. We were getting some background noise. Um, but on the other hand, the chemistry of a cell almost feels inevitable. Um, you know, once you could get all sort of those atoms close enough together to start reacting and become uh, and form polymers and things like that. You know what I mean? So that it just it, there is the chemistry of it does feel inevitable, even though it's improbable. I don't know how to reconcile that, really. Dragon, can I comment something? Yes, please go ahead, SR. And the thing is that if you look at the evolution of the human, uh, within last 15,000 years, the human has evolved in a very faster way. And past uh, 1,000 years, the evolution is quite fast than it is expected. Big uh, and Sisgi uh, are much more experienced than me, I hope. So uh, I put forward the question in front of them that what makes it different? Because as far as uh, my knowledge is concerned, uh, the, there are some fossils that has been um, studied in Peru and they are questioning those fossils that whether they are actually the uh, homo sapiens or mixture of uh, homo sapiens and aliens uh, right um, so maybe the aliens have been here in fact isn't that one of the Fermi paradox solutions is that you know there are aliens uh, but they're and maybe they're even among us but there are you know, camouflaged? Well, um, what if they decided to talk to the dolphins instead of us? You know, we'd never know. We don't know dolphin speak. That's the plot of Star Trek Four. The aliens come to talk <laughs> to the whales and the whales are extinct. <laughs> yeah, you know, we it's the anthropomorphic thing. We think we're so special that they're going to come down and talk to us and all that, but you know, they they could already be here talking to somebody else. It's just that they're smaller and they don't care about us. That reminds oh. me of a very appropriate limerick. The voice from the UFO cried, to the smartest we'll give a free ride. Several men volunteered, but the ship disappeared with a whale and two dolphins inside. <laughs> very nice. Um, well, what uh, forms of sort of exotic forms of life uh, might be not just possible, but maybe kind of probable that we would actually have to specifically be looking for to see them like, I don't know, uh, silica life like the Horta or an energy being like the one that fell in love with, um, oh, what's his name? You know, the discoverer of warp drive. I, uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, just some kind of exotic forms of life that we should at least have on our radar, maybe, to be specifically looking for? In other words, I mean, what about sort of non-DNA life, something like that? 
Yeah, I would like to comment. Uh, I have said prions. Prions, uh, if you look forward to them, they don't have any genetic material, whether it is RNA or DNA. They are just proteins. So it is an interesting form of life. Well, my actually personal belief is that viruses and prions are not alive. They're just particles. And they, they, it, they react with life, they interact with life, but they are not alive. But that would be the first thing we might find. <laughs> well, fair enough. In other words, they react with us, and <laughs> except that we yeah. might be too strange for them to be able to react with us. But... Yeah, yeah. But we're going to have to look at, but if, but if that's what we're looking for, we're going to have to look beyond radio waves. In other words, just because we can't, uh, if we go shouting out there with radio waves and, and don't see anybody, that doesn't mean that the next uh, planet over isn't just teeming with life. It seems to me there's, there's, there's to also, th it. yeah, it seems to me there's also things like, um, I mean, what if the communication is just very slow? Like it's just coming to us, maybe it just takes, I don't know, what if it takes a generation for sort of wavelength by us or or well, you know they, what if it's on, yeah if they live on very cold um uh planets i mean there there was what was there was a good science fiction recently about uh well no wait a second that was the um arthur c clark's 2061 or whatever where they land on europa or someplace and the life that came out of the oh yeah there's was really really slow because it lived in a very very cold environment so uh we could be looking at rocks and rocks we know weather and they they don't communicate the way we do and i'm not saying rocks are alive but it could be very slow right yeah it could be and things can like rocks things can exist for eons and who knows what kind of processes might be happening that are just at such so slow that we can't that seems more probable than highly accelerated life. Yeah, although, although I do like the Star Trek episode where there was an accelerated life and it just sounded like buzzing in your ear. I don't know if anybody remembers that one. I do. Yes. Yeah, there's also reptiles, uh, ectotherms. They, they depend on the temperature of the environment. And, and if they're cold, they tend to move slowly. Well, this kind of, that prompts me to, uh, maybe uh, bring up that, um, you know, I act, I actually kind of think that um, life not unlike ours is, you know, fairly, is probably among the most probable forms of life there are, since we do have at least a data point of one in ourselves that sort of makes life like us the most probable form. And also simply because, you know, we are, constituted of, you know, fairly common elements around the universe that would be, and lots of planets would have the elements that we use, and, um, and the chemistry, you know, if, you know, other conditions are right, water, I suppose, and so forth, um, oxygen, that um, it's not improbable that, you know, you would have um, um, animals with maybe a body pattern not unlike ours, with limbs, and maybe dexterous, you know, extremities like fingers, so eyes, you know. Um, also, you know, that's the other thing about life is that life essentially generates senses to detect sort of everything that you need to detect. Um, you know, electromagnetic radiation, um, uh, pressure, um, and so forth. Um, uh, uh, pressure waves in the atmosphere with our ears, I mean, it sort of detects all the um, sources of information that are out there. That's kind of what life does. Um, you know, I think, so So I don't think it's that improbable that, um, that one, at least one of the forms of life that might be out there would be pretty similar to us. Yes, well, uh, another thing to keep in mind is, um, which is uh, sort of a, a slight disagreement with what you're saying, is that uh, uh, the, the first, uh, animals to have global communication, a global communications network, were not humans, but whales communicated that's, with low that's... frecencies for thousands of kilometers until the, right, there was right. too much noise from shipping. That's I'd even make point. a, 
Yeah, I'd even make a counter argument to that. The first communication was between trees. If you look at the root system that we're just now beginning to understand and some of the... Uh, right, you have the, the symbiosis with fungi. Yeah, all of that. Roots. And, yeah. Right. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's it exactly predates global. whales by millions and millions of years. Yeah, and also, like uh, elephants... It wasn't global, though, was it? Uh... It's not global, but but forest communication is very is very vast. Forest and fungi communication is vast, not global like the whales had. And also, I believe that elephants um, detect very low frequency vibrations on the ground. You know, with the, they have very sensitive and big surface area pad feet that are really sensitive to vibrations on the sound. And I think they can sort of communicate through sort of low frequency rumbles that. Kind of vibrate the ground so that they can kind of communicate across the herd sort of silently um, that way. I'm not, I don't know too much about that, but it's, but it is interesting. Brad, uh, I would like to comment a few things. Uh, the thing is that if you are talking about the communication, all the microorganisms are very much communicative, I will say. It's star, if you look forward to any type of um, microscopic organism too, they are quite communicative with each other. Uh, for example, if we take about uh, the consideration of any type of bacteria, uh, they usually communicate with each other too, it has been found. Uh, the thing is that it all depends upon the chemistry and uh, the need for food for towards, towards which all the microorganisms are going towards and uh, it is uh, i think it is also possible that uh, life can exist without the uh, important materials that are present in our uh, earth like uh, water and oxygen it can also exist without that for example if we see any type of anaerobic reaction uh, many types of microorganisms can stay over there. Even some microorganisms can uh, live in the microgravity too. Uh, yes, and I'm also reminded of the exotic life forms that we find in thermal vents and in the deep ocean. And I think it was the discovery of these um, uh, life forms, these extremophiles, um, that really, really uh, rejuvenated uh, this whole discussion. Um, as we discovered, uh, you know, I mean, there are extremophiles in the thermal vents that don't use oxygen at all. They metabolize sulfur. They don't need any sunlight, which is remarkable. Yeah, I'll, I'll derail the conversation just a little bit here. Since we're, talking, <laughs> we're talking about okay. communication and we're talking about intelligence. So let's let's talk about elephants now. I mean, you mentioned elephants before. Right. The thing yeah. about elephants is that um, <clears throat> what they found when they studied elephants is that if you say the word elephant, okay, if you say the word elephant, they don't react if you say it in, 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 say, English. But, and if you're a female and you say it in the local language of the people there, there's no reaction. But if you're a young man and you say elephant in the local language, the elephants panic because they have been hunted by those men in the past. They, they can understand human languages. Uh... I might point out real quick, uh, the, just what I put in text is, we're talking about uh, communications that are very local, and the only way to do that would be kind of um, on a yeah, planet. On, You're yeah, saying, on site. Yeah, on site with uh, the medium that we use, or possibly very slow, like we do have particles that have come from Mars to Earth, that have found in Antarctica, that sort of stuff. And the only way to get beyond that, I think at least, is electromagnetic radiation. And so what we may be talking about is, is there could be a lot of intelligent life, there could be all kinds of communicative life, but just not that many that ha play with, um, yeah, or neutrinos, uh, if they're able to harness those. Uh, but those are slow also because they're particles. Um, yeah. But in other words, if you, unless you've, harness radio excuse me electromagnetic radiation which encompasses radio waves etc then maybe there just isn't a lot of interstellar communication well i think that's an outstanding point um and you know it makes me think that 
Really, the most obvious explanation for the Fermi paradox is the sheer size of space that everything is so far away and and that light is so slow um compared to the size of space light is sluggish it's like moving through molasses and i you know that is probably the most obvious reason is that everyone is just too yeah that's that's one argument i've heard but it, it doesn't really hold water if you consider advanced civilizations if they have been around for millions of years, the speed of light is not a problem. They, they can uh, colonize the entire galaxy moving at sublight speeds. Oh, that's so, a good point. He mentioned that in his video that given enough time and a high enough technology, you know, you would, yeah, you would be able to just populate every habitable planet. Yeah, the that's type it. three civilizations that uh, were mentioned yeah. Uh, yeah. as the Kardashev scale in the video. But um, that, so. So there, that's where the real question should be. In other words, why have we not seen evidence of any life that, in other words, if life could do that, why haven't we seen any evidence? That's really where the question should be. Yes, it's, you know, the, the deep time sort of negates deep space. They sort of cancel each other out. So that if you have enough time, um, the distances uh, become less important. Um, Presuming that the civilization could survive long enough to, to take advantage of deep time. One problem with the Fermi paradox is, or, or I guess you could look at it as a problem, it's an underlying assumption, let's say, is that there are, is, um, there are civilizations that are much older than ours and much more advanced than ours. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe it takes a long time to produce a, a, an intelligent civilization. So there aren't that many out there, and they're um, not more advanced than we are. Or at least well, in our area, in other words, within a few million light years or something. Maybe we really are special in that way, and the video brought that up. Uh, All right. right. And Bregon, I would like to say something. Yes, uh, go ahead, we, yes. If we consider our science and technology, we have still, yet till now, we have not crossed our solar system. The first important thing that I would like to put forward as a note. Secondly, the thing is that the interference of all the communications that are coming out from the space. Uh, there are lots of uh, signals that uh, we are getting, we are receiving and there are many uh, receiving points in our earth and we are studying all those things. But what about the interference that are happening? And secondly, the, uh, we are not, uh, yet till now we are not scientifically not well advanced enough to focus on something uh, that, yes, there is an Earth-like uh, planet, uh, but we cannot focus inside it like a, uh, like a telescope that, yes, we can see the land and we can see if some creatures are crawling over there. It's not possible. Yet till now we have not advanced in such a way that we can do, we can say that yes, we have proof or we can prove it that uh, there are some living forms in other planets. Well, I certainly have something to say to that. First of all, yeah, we have crossed the solar system, not not uh, as human beings, but as, uh, as as probes that have been sent across the solar system. And no, we cannot resolve a, a planet. We cannot resolve the features on an exoplanet currently. But all you need is a telescope, a telescope in space, for example, and a telescope where you could do that. A James Webb telescope, I don't think, will be big enough to actually do what you're suggesting. But this is only a matter of time. We can actually do that eventually. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, uh, excuse me. The thing is that uh, the, we have already, NASA has sent uh, already many satellites and uh, they have tried to track out uh, the main intention was to track out the other living forms but uh, the important thing behind it is all the satellites are near to failure because of the lack of energy they are not getting enough amount of solar energy so that all the instruments that are on board over there can be used properly so it's a big problem for us well, that's not the limiting factor for finding a, a, to actually image an exoplanet. To image an exoplanet, all you need is a really big telescope, which can be built. It's not a question yeah. of energy, it's just a question of size of the telescope.
Aren't there uh, proposals to, um, or uh, not proposals, but um, uh, concepts to, you know, uh, create a gigantic radio telescope, for example, with one end sort of uh, being, you know, on the other side of the sun, essentially, sort of a solar system sized telescope? Um, you know, you could just um, uh, uh, put the dishes just incredibly far apart in space and create a gigantic telescope. Yes, you're talking about an interferometer. Uh, you can use interferometers to get high resolution. The problem with interferometers is that they don't fill all the space between, so you don't have the, the sensitivity of a large telescope. You do have oh, the, the resolution, but you don't have the sensitivity. Okay. I think the uh, argument that we're using kind of comes down to the radio waves thing, in other words, or any electromagnetic waves, is that we we know that somebody can, you know, have visited us if they'd been around for a billion years or whatever just because of the type 3 uh, argument. But in other words, how come, unless we just aren't looking in the right spectrum or whatever, how come we don't see any intelligence communications going on? That's, that's my biggest question. Well, I don't, what do you think? I mean... Um, is it, as you mentioned, I think even early in your opening statement, is it just we have such a small sample size, we just have to um, sort of brute force our way through it uh, over maybe generations of just searching across all, uh, you know, a bigger and bigger sample size? Well, if well like simple... I go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, if, there, if there's a civilization like ours, the only way we're going to know they're there is if it actually beam radiation towards us. The, the, the big question then is if is if the civilization is much more advanced than ours, then why don't we know they're there? Because you, there will be small signs of it. But uh, I'm, I'm suggesting that maybe there aren't advanced civilizations out there. Well, certainly the longer it goes of not seeing them, in other words, radio waves, uh, considering like an argument earlier that radio waves were kind of stumbled on and probably everybody would stumble on them, is uh, lowers the probability at least in our area, of there being an advanced civilization that uses radio waves. I mean, you could, um, that, that's, that's the argument there. Um, Vic, is another way we could possibly detect life, although not communicate with it, um, even through, with our existing technology, I think one of the ways they try to do it on exoplanets is to look for signs of pollution, for example. Um, in the atmosphere of the planet, in the constituents of the uh, atmospheric planet, and that that might be an indication of life. And by pollution, I guess I mean not just um, the, the byproducts of industry, but even just the byproducts of life that might. Hey, con consider that oxygen is a huge pollutant. Uh, I mean, that's, I <laughs> you know, that that's the biggest detection in other words if i were to look at a planet and i detected a lot of oxygen i would say oh my goodness they're very similar to earth yeah yeah i think that's right so i think that is one of the strategies that they use well speaking of strategies if, if you're to find life on another planet there is a, a, an indirect way to do this uh, i think this was done with the galileo space probe carl sagan had this great idea that the, the space probe in order to get it out to uh, jupiter they used gravity assist and they had to bring it by the planet Earth. He said, let's aim it at Earth and see if we can detect uh, any signs of life oh, on Earth. Fascinating. And, and he said, you know, there's an unusual mix of gases, oxygen and nitrogen, which is an unusual mix of gases, so um, which suggests that there could be life on that planet. But um, the idea is that for exoplanets, if you look at an exoplanet when it transits a star, you can look at the atmosphere in absorption, and you can look for specific absorption lines. And if you see the red absorption lines, that will tell you the composition of that atmosphere. For example, if it has oxygen, then you have uh, uh, have, a, uh, have an indication that there might be life on that planet. Another thing you can do is see if those um, if those spectral lines change over time, and that's something that all weather you'd be able to observe the weather on an exo. Yeah, uh, fascinating, and that's what I yeah. So, and those are things we can do now with just our existing technology, basically. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just hoping that in my lifetime that, uh, okay, this is just pure ego, but in my lifetime I'd love to find at least some life outside 
of the Earth. I mean, Mars, whatever, and I don't care if it's a virus. In other words, that says that we're not alone. Uh, I agree. I'd bet, it, I'd, I'd bet my life that there is other life, but I'd love to find it before I die. Um, I'm kind of pessimistic. My sort of view is that we are, for all practical intents and purposes, alone. Um, uh, there's no one out there for us to talk to. Um, if there is intelligent life out there, but I also agree with you, Vic, that the discovery of any form of life off of Earth, any indigenous life off of Earth, um, would uh, be extremely comforting. <laughs> well, there's there, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just going to say it's possible you'll find life on on Mars, and there may be bacteria on Mars that that hasn't that haven't been found yet. It hasn't been ruled out, but. I don't know. Do you think they'll really find life on Mars? It just, I, it's just—it's possible really because they found some surface yeah. water, right? Yes, they no. did. They found lakes of it, big, big, long, kilometer uh, long um, water. Uh, in other words, not unfrozen by the poles. I mean, anywhere there's water is where you want to look, at least for life like this. What would be spectacular would be either way. In other words, if you found something that was similar to life on Earth, in other words, similar DNA. Or if you found maybe something that was similar that had a slight tweak in the DNA or something totally different. I mean, any of those would be just outstanding discoveries. You know, we could, I mean, it wouldn't even have to be DNA if we could find something that sort of self-replicated somehow. Some kind of a polymer that self-replicates or something that or like or a virus. is able to, or, or, is, or right, a virus. Right, something that's able to, also something that's able to utilize energy in, in its environment, you know. But Vic makes a very good point. We don't even have to find intelligent life to begin with. What we want to find is any kind of life outside the Earth. If we can do that, that would be amazing. That would be a yeah, paradigm yeah, shift. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to... I'm sorry. Go ahead, SR. Okay. I'd like to put some point that uh, uh, as far as uh, I have heard that uh, there are some Earth-like planets which have been... Uh, explode out and there are possibility uh, that uh, the environment and the atmosphere is quite similar with earth but the question is let us guess that uh, it is just only one light year uh, ahead of, uh, i'm i'm to say distant from us uh, how we will go because if we have to take out the whole human civilization and make a space travel it will take us about one light year. It is a big thing. So many generations. And what will happen when we are traveling in the space? These are the big questions in front of us. Yeah, you're talking about maybe a sort of multi-generational spacecraft, which I think, I think is it. I think. Uh, yes, yes. And the most important thing is uh, uh, the when we are going to the space we are exposed to so much radiations that we have to protect our means we have to build our spaceship in such a way that we can protect ourselves we can the most important thing that in uh, the microgravity is our bones the bone density uh, decreases a lot that is a one of the big problem yeah it's there's a lot of challenges Okay, um, SR, brings it, up a, SR brings up a very good point. It's, it, this is a little bit off topic, but it's nonetheless interesting. Is how we, how would we visit other stars? Uh, the microgravity pro problem is not won't, won't be a, a real problem because the, the ships will be spinning, so you get a, a you'll have a centripetal effect, which will make uh, simulate gravity. So if you're going to have to travel for generations, you want to have gravity so that our, our the uh, the shape. famous the famous treadmill running scene in 2001: A Space Odyssey. Well, in that in that particular case, they actually had part of the, part of the uh, of the uh, of their spacecraft was uh, was rotating, so they were able to run around inside it. Which you... Right. But the point is, if you have a, a big generational spaceship, which you'd need if you can't if there's no such thing as FTL travel faster than light, then you will need to travel for decades to visit even the nearest stars. And you'll have to have proper spaceships, shielding from radiation, as SR mentions. And you'd also have to have uh, some means of uh, artificial gravity. Yeah, but, it, yeah, but it can yeah, be done. Yeah. 
There is nothing yeah. fundamental yeah. That, that can prevent us. From yes, from yes. Then you have to rotate the whole spacecraft like the Earth at that same speed, so no. that you can generate the uh, centripetal and centrifugal force. What you need is it, the, the rate of rotation is 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 determined by the size, the radius. It's basically v squared over r. Would the uh, would rel would relativistic it effects it become a challenge? Sorry, sorry, Berrigan. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Susie. Uh, I was just asking: um, Would relativistic effects become an issue uh, as you uh, as you? I'm, I'm assuming, for example, if you're using some kind of a solar sail or something, that you're accelerating over time, sort of and sort of you know increasingly approaching the speed of light. So or very, very high speeds. Uh, so do relativistic effects become a challenge, like the slowing it's, down of time? It depends on, on, on your propulsion. Uh, if, you can, if you can accelerate long enough that you get close to the speed of light, then, then it would seem like you're passing a, a number of light years in, in only a few months, for example. But uh, as far as current technology is concerned, I'm not sure how fast we can get up to. Maybe Vic has a better idea of that. But it would be something like 0.2 or 0.3 of the speed of light, maybe, if we're looking. That wouldn't have okay, very okay. strong relativistic effects. Yeah, okay. So um, we're getting close to our, our time. Um, and uh, I wanted to give uh, maybe Chantal an opportunity to make any announcements she might have, uh, maybe in uh, nearby chat. And um, why don't, uh, maybe a good way to sort of finish up is everyone take a turn maybe with some brief uh, closing remarks. So Vic, why don't you uh, start with maybe um, uh, just a, a minute or two? Oh, sure, okay. Uh, this will be just brief, but um, first of all, you have to step back and, and uh, say how wonderful it is that uh, our species has got to the point where we even think about something beyond ourselves. Um, it may not seem that way every day, <laughs> but uh, that we can think about other civilizations and out there and be willing to try to uh, contact them without wanting to eat them or whatever, uh, I just applaud the whole idea. Um, and perhaps there are other aliens out there with similar ideas. I think I think the paranoid thing about we shouldn't, uh, you know, go out there because they're going to eat us is kind of uh, just, I don't know, it's 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 anthropomorphic. It's it's the t sign of the times. I'd love to find other uh, aliens and learn what they're like. Absolutely. Um, Syzygy, thank you, Vic. Yeah. Um... From what I've what I, from what I've seen of, of the uh, or what I've, I've I've learned of the Fermi paradox, uh, I think I know the reason. But I mean, of course, I'm just guessing. I mean, there are, there is not enough data to really answer the question. But I'm just gonna take a guess. And my guess is that the, there are civilizations out there that are no, not much more advanced than ours, and there aren't that many of them. I mean, that that's my guess. All right, very good. And SR, do you have any brief uh, closing comments? Uh, well, I would like to say that uh, uh, he has said the uh, most important thing that uh, with, yet till now I don't think that there are no uh, advanced civilization like us. Otherwise, we would have been able to contact with them. And I hope that one day, like Vic has said in his lifetime, he wants to see like that. And I also, in my lifetime, also want to see same thing that we have been able to discover something which will be a fascinating for our whole human society. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Um, please give a round of applause to our panel members to thank them for their participation. Um, I think my closing thought is that um, I think it's cool that we can all gather here together and talk about this problem because in this, you know, for, for all we know, we are the only conscious life in the universe, and here we are reflecting on the nature of the universe, and in a sense, we are the consciousness of the universe. We make the universe awake. 
and um, we're demonstrating that here tonight. So thanks very much, everyone, for, for participating, and have a great weekend, and Boomer Sooner beat Baylor. Thank you all. And thanks to our moderator and to Science Circle in general for hosting this.